Joining the program this morning is legendary drummer and Emmy-nominated performer for the band Ambrosia. We welcome in the legendary Burley Drummond. Burley, Brian C., thank you so much for being with me on KMET Radio. Hey, Brian, thanks for having me. Pleasure. Oh, no doubt about it. Burley, Burley, let's talk about how your infatuation with music began and how your roots of performing first originated. Well, okay. Uh, I had kind of a strange beginning. I was a... Uh, I was an army brat, so I, you know, I spent four years in Ankara, Turkey, uh, when I was, you know, seven, seven years old to about eleven, and I wandered into a, a bazaar and got separated from my uh, parents, and ended up watching the uh, the craftsmen make a big uh, copper plate, and they were spinning it and circling it, hammering it, spinning it, spinning it. I think I was in a trance for a couple hours, and that's when the uh, ever since then, I've been trying to make music out of hitting things. So, there you go. That's that's my awesome, awesome beginning. And Burley, that's what attracted you to the drum, correct? Well, yeah, I think the drums, you know, kind of, you know, stem from that. But uh, you know, as a as an early kid, I I think my first three records I could buy uh, at the, you know, the army base was uh, "It's Late" by Ricky Nelson, "The Martian Hop." And the Battle of 1814 by Johnny Horton. So, pretty strange beginnings musically. But uh, ever since, uh, because I traveled all over the world, it, uh, I was very influenced by uh, music from all over the world. And that, it's still a huge influence for me. Burley, take me back to the very first gig you performed in. Talk about that very first performance, that experience in your career. <clears throat> well, the very first one... Um, uh, I had been a student for a while of, you know, of the drums, and uh, I went, uh, I got a call to play, and uh, I was at, up in Hollywood at some, you know, high, high-end high restaurant, and uh, it was a hot, it was a pretty intense jazz gig that, you know, that I was probably not prepared for, but, you know, I just jumped in, and after, after the gig, some of my heroes that I had been uh, listening to uh, were in the audience, or and came up to me and were very encouraging, and uh, that was my confirmation that, yeah, this is something I should be doing. And uh, it was overwhelmingly uh, supportive. So that, that's probably my strongest memory is that I was validated uh, at the beginning. Of course, you know, I mean, any career has its ups and downs, and uh, you have to reassess and, uh, and continually... Uh, continually stoke the fires that keep your, uh, um, you know, desire burning. So um, I can't say it's all been a bed of roses, but it's been a lot of roses, and enough to keep me going, yes. Now, Burley, wh when was the idea which came to your mind to form a band? When did that originate? What is your earliest recollection of that? Your, did you Was that your goal as a young performer? I, you know, I didn't really think about it. I just thought about playing. And, uh, of course, you know, some of my earliest band uh, memories, I'm going to see bands with things like Cream and uh, and uh, Jimi Hendrix and Led Zeppelin. Jeff Ortal was huge for me. But uh, uh, then I, the first band I, I got in, I was, I think I was starting in, uh, I was in high school. And it's funny because I ended up playing with this guitar player. And, you know, I... Um, it was my mom and I living in Mar Vista, and I somehow got hooked up with these Beverly Hills kids. And I remember the dad coming home, you know, for one of the kids and, you know, talking about this band he had seen. He was in the music business, and he, it was the association, and he was going on about how loud they were. And, you know, and now I'm reflecting, like, how loud could the association have been? You know, it's like, uh, so it's just so funny how things have changed dynamically. Uh, from the association being called the loud band to today, they'd be like soft pop, you know. So, and, and anyway, I've, I've had a, I've had a lot of interesting, uh, like for instance, Ambrosia. Uh, they found they were the three of them, my three partners, Dave Pack, Joe Puerta, and Chris North, were actually together, and they needed, they wanted a new drummer, and they found my name in the musicians' contact service, which is a little storefront on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood where for $5 you could put your name on a 3x5 card and what you did. And uh, they saw my name, 
And I think they were interested in me because of my name. And the next thing I knew, I was in the band and the rest is history. Yeah, no question. Um, so let's talk about the formation of Ambrosia. Um, so how did that happen? Well, you know, they, they were looking for a drummer. They saw my name. Uh, they weren't Ambrosia yet, but when we connected, uh, they came over to my, my apartment where I live, and, uh, and we became a band just talking in my living room because our mutual, we had such strong mutual interest. And, um, so this, I think the first time we played or rehearsed, I think our first song lasted like an hour and a half. Uh, we were just so inspired by playing with each other and we still are. And, uh, so it was a good connection. And then, um, you know, we played and wrote. And we, you know, we were outside the uh, the normal band. Uh, we were doing everything from avant-garde jazz to, you know, classical to, you know, of course, rock. Uh, and then it took us a couple of years and we got noticed and we got a deal. And the first deal was with Russ Regan from 20th Century Fox. The same guy that discovered Elton John, Neil Diamond, Barry White, and uh, he never had a progressive band, so we became his progressive band and had our first hit, Holding On to Yesterday. Yeah, 1970, uh, Ambrosia brought to our pop culture a, mi a mixture of classical, progressive, R&B, and soul mixed together. Were each band members into each genre of music? Well, I wouldn't say. Um, I, I'd say we developed uh, the R and B side as we went along, uh, and one of the contributing factors was uh, when we were doing our first couple albums, we were considered more of a prog band. America's Answer to King Crimson, Genesis, Yes, uh, and then, but at night uh, because we were very poor in those days. We would work a uh, a nightclub uh, and and play. We had to play R and B. And this, we'd play this club. We'd record all day and then go play this club at night. Uh, and we were playing R and B at night. So slowly, the R and B kind of crept into our psyche, and uh, and we be, we began to appreciate it because you know you are what you eat, and we were playing that every night, and so it kind of crept into uh, our style of writing. And then songs like, um, you know, How Much I Feel, Biggest Part of Me, You're the Only Woman, kind of more R&B-ish started being penned by some of the members in the band. And uh, there, that's when we kind of started adding the R&B flavor to the music. Yeah, and that leads me to my next question, Burley. I wanted to ask you if you could talk a little bit about those three iconic songs, How Much I Feel, Biggest Part of Me, You're the Only Woman. Can you talk a little bit about the creation of each of those uh, iconic songs? Well, sure. Uh, you know, and uh, all three of those songs were uh, lyrically and primarily written by Mr. Dave Pack, who uh, uh, really, really embraced that vocal style. He was hugely influenced by Marvin Gaye. And so, uh, it, you know, uh, like I said, we were playing this club, and playing those kind of R&B type songs every night. And uh, it was just a natural evolution that we would start writing those kind of songs. We never deserted the frog. Uh, the frog was always with us, but these other songs kind of crept into the mix. And um, it was nice. I mean, at first, um, uh, you know, back in, that, back in the 70s, um, there was AM and there was FM radio. And we were kind of originally the FM babies or darlings because, you know, we were doing, we were American band doing prog music. And, you know, <clears throat> and then when we had How Much I Feel, you know, some of those same uh, radio stations were a little uh, upset with us, you know, and they felt like we had deserted the prog cause because we, cause we had a, you know, a pretty blatant uh, hit uh, with How Much I Feel, and that was not what they were expecting from us. But we always thought of ourselves as, uh, you know, we were modeling ourselves after the Beatles and thought, well, if they could do Yesterday and then do I Am the Walrus, you know, why couldn't, uh, why couldn't we have as wide of interest as that and, and do music that, you know, stretched the boundaries? So, uh, you know, for us, it was just like, this is something we wrote and we like it. Let's do it. 
Uh, whereas this was before radio stations. Well, radio stations were just at that point. I mean, radio, um, excuse me, uh, record companies was just at that point trying to, you know, limit the scope of what artists could do, you know, so that they could market it better. They, you know, like if you, they didn't want a band that could do uh, Yesterday and I'm the Walrus. They wanted a band that just did Yesterday or, you know, <laughs> the other. You know, they didn't really want the, all the broad styles, but we didn't grow up that way. We grew up doing, you, you can do everything. And that's, uh, that's what Ambrosia was based on, the fact that we had so many different interests and so many writing styles. We're talking to legendary drummer Burley Drummond. Burley, is it true that Alan Parsons engineered your first album? Well, uh, no, it's not true. It's true to a sense. He didn't engineer the first album. Uh, that was uh, Chuck Johnson and Bill. Uh, and Chuck Johnson was the main engineer of the first album. But what Alan did do is he came in and mixed. Uh, he did the final mix on the album, and uh, and he was nominated for two Grammys for that. And he we we became aware of Alan Parsons from Dark Side of the Moon, uh, and he of course received a Grammy for that. Um, and and what's funny about it, uh, the combination of Chuck Johnson and Alan Parsons, uh, that vinyl record is considered one of the best pieces of recorded vinyl in history. So wow. it, they obviously did a good job. Now, how about uh, Ambrosia's love for Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young? Uh, is, is that uh, accurate to say uh, you had, Ambrosia had a love for Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young? Yes, but oh, absolutely. But I think it was as much a, uh, a progression from uh, the Beach Boys and the Beatles and the love of harmony, you know, all the way from the Everly Brothers. Uh, so <clears throat> Crosby, Stills, and Nash & Young were, you know, were basically just a... Uh, a long line of uh, of artists in that that treasured harmony, and you know, um, did a lot of harmony on their records, and also too that uh, kind of the singer songer singer songwriter um, character, like say James uh, Jackson Brown, uh, you know, was was becoming interested. In fact, Joe Puerto was very influenced by that, you know, and wrote songs in, of that nature. So yeah, I no doubt about it. They were they were a huge uh, influence. Now the seventies and eighties, as you know, with so much talent and competition and so many bands, would you say there was a lot of jealousy uh, amongst your rivals back then with Ambrosia, or or not really? No, I wouldn't call it jealousy. I think it was a lot of mutual respect. And uh, uh -huh. in fact, as, as we toured, I mean, we toured a lot with the Beach Boys, and we toured a lot. With a lot of artists, but like, like um, uh, you know, uh, the Doobie Brothers and the Heart and all those kind of acts, Fleetwood Mac, and uh, some we became closer to than others. Like Michael McDonald became uh, a very close friend to the band, and uh, and some of the Beach Boys. Uh, so I, it, it depended, you know, like say like a band like Sticks, we toured with, and you know, the, it was it, we never really became. Close. It was very. It was much more competitive. So, yes and no. Some bands were. Some bands weren't. You know. Uh, uh, but you know, all in all, it was a great experience. Even the competitive part of it was good. You know, because you went out and played harder. You know, you you tried, especially when you're double billed with a band. You go out and try to, you know, it. You take it. You you make it a little competitive, and that's good for you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Ambrosia, five Grammy nominations, five hit songs. The album 180 earned Ambrosia three Grammy nominations. I bet the band was overall proud of the hard work you guys did for that nomination. Yeah, we were. Um, uh, I think I, I just remember being at the Grammys, and I think we were up for best uh, vocal performance on a song and or – I forget the exact categories that we were up for, but, you know, and then we lost to uh, Funky Town. Um, you know, and I used to like that song. <laughs> <laughs> now, is, is it a fact, Burley, that David Lewis left the band in 82, replaced by one of my favorite musicians, Bruce Hornsby? Yeah, uh, David, uh, uh, he was he was in kind of a, a jazz group, um, 
forget the name of it, but really good band. Uh, and they, and who actually won a Grammy, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, senility's killing me, but, uh, uh, yeah. So, and then Bruce Hornsby spent about six months with us. And that, and right after that, uh, Bruce was in the band. The band took a break because, uh, we had such bad business with our manager and stuff like that, that we, we had to, we had to stop, uh, to, you know, to kind of clear the air and, and it's actually the best thing that could have happened to me because uh, when you're in a band, especially a band like that, you, you don't really have a life too much outside of that band because that's, it's so consuming what you have to do with recording and touring and you know, all that. So when the band stopped, uh, I was able to meet my wife and start a family. And, you know, that's when a major part of my life began. And actually, the, the part of life that I even treasure the most. So, uh, when the band got back together, personally, I was in a much better place because I had the other side of my life in place. You know, my love life, and uh, and you know, right. having a family. It put it, it put everything in perspective. You know, where you know, when you when you're young and you, you have a music career, you know, you, it, it tends to become all about you. You know, and what right. you're doing. And then when you when you mature and have a family, then it's not all about you. Uh, it's it's about your family, and and then it it puts everything more into perspective, and you're able to enjoy what you're doing because you have this other side of life to live in. You know. Now, now was your wife uh, an, an an Ambrosia fan? You know, it's what's funny is she was aware of Ambrosia. But not necessarily, you know, a huge fan. She was much more Jimi Hendrix and, oh, really? you know, Steppenwolf. Uh, she was a rocker. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, <clears throat> she's really one of the best musicians I've ever known. And, uh, and, you know, can sight read anything. I mean, we've, she's amazing. I mean, it's like, uh, I had a lot of encounters with the people from Z Frank Zappa and, you know, she would sight read that music and, you know, really pissed some of the members of Zappa off because she could sight read what they had to practice, you know, and <laughs> she, she, she could just go and play it. And so, you know, she's, she's an amazing musical talent and, and, you know, she's in Ambrosia now. So it's, it's oh, me, she is. Have, oh yeah. She tours with us, plays keyboards and things. <clears throat> and for me, it's, you know, it's like, I, I have the best of both worlds now. You know, I have, I have my love life with me, and you know I have my music life with me, and they all work together. So it's great. Now, uh, let me ask you, Burley, out of all the albums and tracks Ambrosia has recorded, which is your favorite and why? Uh, I'd have to go be between the very first album, uh, Ambrosia. Uh, um, I, there was just something, there was an innocence about it uh, where everyone was unaffected by the business, the music business and really gave a hundred percent, uh, without questioning or without, uh, judging or, you know, uh, there was, there was, there was no, <clears throat> uh, downside. It was just all pour your heart into this. So it was the most innocent. And I think, uh, it, it was, the, I thought it was the best of Ambrose. I thought Chris Norris on keyboards was, was genius you know what he did was just amazing and then you know as as, as you progress I, i'm proud of all our records and all our songs but as you progress you progress uh, you know the business enters into it and can kind of jade you uh, you know like you know things some things aren't fair you know life is not fair and neither is the music business by any stretch of the imagination so i think uh i i think the the two most uh profound were maybe the first record uh ambrosia and uh, the last record rhode island which not many people have heard but i thought it was like it was it was a, it was a band finally going okay you know well here's here we're gonna we're gonna play the way we want to play and that's <clears throat> i'm very proud of that record we're talking to the legendary Burley Drummond of Ambrosia. Burley, let's talk about Tin Drum and how did that concept develop for you? Well, okay. Um, when, uh, like I said, when Ambrosia took its initial break in the mid uh, 
80s, I met my wife, and um, we started a family, had a son, and, you know, we were both, she was playing with Jimmy Buffett and XTC and Animal Logic, and I was playing with people like Jim Messina and uh, uh, a great blues artist, Mighty Mo Rogers. So we were both touring, and we had a young son, and so it was literally, we were handing our son off to each other in an airport a lot of times. She'd be coming in, I'd be going out, you know, hey, honey, I was great to see you, here's our son, and, you know, and it just got to the point where, we were both, uh, it was like two careers, you know, trying to exist together. And we finally just decided that the only way we were going to spend enough time together was to play together, to be in a project together. So we started 10 Drums, and we did the three records, uh, and they all got critical acclaim, like indie, best indie release. And, um, and so... And what's funny is, and then eventually Mary became, uh, her name's Mary Harris, and she, uh, she became more and more involved in Ambrosia because Ambrosia needed uh, the, what she could provide, the talent she could provide. So, um, you know, she, it, and now at this point, where we're, we're realizing is that 10 Drum is what we really, really uh, want to do. We love doing Ambrosia, but we want to get back to 10 Drum. Uh, you know we can't do anything full time anymore. Um, so, but we want to we want to do another record next year and and concentrate on Tin Drum. So we're excited about it because we have a bunch of songs that we really like and we can't wait to record them. And for our audience listening and our Ambrosia fans listening, the website is tindrum dot net. Correct. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And and on that website you can. Uh, it has all the information on your concerts and interviews and all about your career. So that's the uh, website, tindrum.net. Now, Burley, what I want to do is I want to play a, a few of those classic Ambrosia hits. Is that okay? Of course. Go for it. Sean, let's play Ambrosia. stuff burly that's great stuff oh thanks man yeah i i always enjoy hearing it what do you think of today's music well um i i hear amazing things i mean uh uh i i mean i have my theories of about some of it i mean uh uh i really enjoy some of the new i mean singer songwriters and uh 
I tend to like the more broken down stuff. I got to say, um, when some of this, you know, it's like a producer's engineer's world, you know, and uh, they can take they can take bands that really can't play that well and and polish them and to the point where they sound amazing. But I think sometimes uh, what, what I think I think what you fall in love with in music is I think you fall in love with people's uh, flaws. Uh, you know, like as as good a, as a performer can be, I think what attracts you or what what your heart goes for is their their imperfection. Uh, and sometimes when you when you correct something to the point where it's so called perfect. It, it may be, uh, it's like, it's like almost eating something that's almost too sweet. You know, it's, it's good. You appreciate it, but it's like, you can't, it, you, you don't want to live with it. You know, it's like, it's almost, uh, it doesn't stick. It, it, there's nothing that gets in your heart. So that's my feeling about it is that sometimes overcorrecting and making imperfect music is, Perfect music is not perfect. <laughs> yeah, no, no question. Listen, the, they're telling me I have a few seconds left, so I really appreciate all the music you've given us, and thank you so much for a few minutes of your time. It's been my honor to be here. Thank you for having me. Honor for me to have you. You take care of yourself. Okay, buddy. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. That was the legendary Burley Drummond of Ambrosia. Until next week, happy collecting to all.